On behalf of the Louisiana Center for the Book in the State Library of Louisiana, thank you for joining us for this virtual 2021 Louisiana Book Festival presentation. This program is New Orleans Portrayed with David Spielman and John Lawrence. Originally from Oklahoma, David Spielman is called New Orleans home for the past four decades. He has worked on projects on six continents, ranging from fine art to hard news photographs published in books and journals. His previously published books include Southern Writers, Katrinaville Chronicles, When Not Performing, and The Katrina Decade. In 2016, Spielman was awarded the Louisiana Endowment of the Humanities Documentary Photographer of the Year Award. In addition to photography, Spielman often gives lectures and presentations about his work, offering a very personal view of his New Orleans. John H. Lawrence is the former director of museum programs at the historic New Orleans Collection, where he planned and implemented exhibitions and various programs. He was also the head of curatorial collections, having oversight of pictorial and object holdings numbering more than 500,000 items. In over 45 years at the historic New Orleans Collection, the New Orleans native has held the positions of curator of photographs and senior curator, writing and lecturing widely about aspects of contemporary and historic photography. Ladies and gentlemen, David Spielman and John Lawrence. So we are here this afternoon at the Louisiana Book Festival to talk with David Spielman about New Orleans portrayed. Uh, I'm John Lawrence, Emeritus at the Historic New Orleans Collection. And I just wanted to offer thanks to uh, Robert Wilson, Jim Davis, and all of the folks at the State Library who put on the Louisiana Book Festival and for technical support for this teleconference by uh, Bruce Kelstrom. And uh, David, if you want to welcome people, uh, now's the time. No, I, I just want to reiterate what you just said. Um, these folks have had a heck of a time. It's a start and a stop, canceled, pushed back, so on and so forth. And they've been diligent, patient, and very generous with their energies and, and talents. So I've, a big thanks to all of them. Our, um, our format uh, today, we're trying to keep it as close to possible as it would have been had we been able to do this in person. Um, and, and so the, what we're going to do is um, I'm going to kind of interview David about certain aspects of New Orleans portrayed uh, his most recent book. And, uh, and hopefully this will um, uh, prompt you to seek further interest in this publication once this, uh, once this interview is broadcast and, um, and to contact either David or me via the book festival with questions you might have that have been prompted by, uh, by our presentation. Um, so David, the, um, here we are in 2021, the tricentennial feels like it was <laughs> years ago, <laughs> at least three years ago. Um, and, uh, but one of the things that struck me when you told me that you were undertaking this project is that you didn't want the result to be released in 2018. You wanted it to be about 2018, which means that you were photographing during the year of the tricentennial. And I wondered if you could uh, talk about how you approached New Orleans as it turned 300, and especially as, as you considered how this might wind up in a publication. Well, it, it was a little bit um, less structured than one might think. The 300th anniversary was a benchmark that I thought made sense. Now, um, I haven't been here 300 years, so I figured it wasn't a great way to do it, but I've, I've been here almost 50. And I just thought it was a, a, a point by which I could focus and uh, you know, people would ask me, is it gonna be published for the anniversary? And I said, no, um, but it was, it was just a kind of a, a, a line in the sand that I wanted to use. Um, and, and, but also keep me directed to spend one year really delving in to New Orleans. And um, uh, to give people a sense of how 
uh, how this happened. I think the first three slides uh, uh, that we have, if, if uh, they could be put up, um, I just wanted you to, to maybe say a few things about them as exemplars of, of the book at different points in its development. Well, one of the premises that I wanted to work on was the serendipitous of New Orleans is probably one of our greatest assets. This photograph is the front of Commander's Palace. I happened to be in my gallery, which is catty corner from the restaurant, talking with some visitors. And I looked out of the window and this was the tableau that was there. Now you'll notice a young man exiting the left side of the photograph. He's in Bermuda shorts. His name is Austin. He lives in the neighborhood. He doesn't work. He's got a disability or something that prevents him from working, but everybody knows him. Everybody likes him. So yes, I had images of him out of the frame, but I wanted him in there so there could be no question that this was not a structured setup kind of a shot. Now, if you look closely at the fellow on the stilts, it appears that he's looking up, but in actuality, he's pushed his mask up and he's actually looking at his cell phone. So there's no question that this is today. A lot of people have thought it was 30 years ago. They thought it was the circus or something like that. So this serendipitousness is paramount in what I'm trying to accomplish. You can show the yeah. next slide. Yeah. I, I, think, I think there's a lot going on in that picture and it's no, it's no surprise to me that uh, you and the publishers, uh, University of Louisiana at Lafayette Press chose, um, chose this for the cover image. Um, uh, could we go to the next slide? Again, the vast majority of people in New Orleans don't ever see this view of the city. Um, at Algiers Point at sunset one evening and um, you know, looking at this picture, you would think the real estate prices over there would be higher than they are in the in the garden district because it's spectacular. Um, it's the million dollar view. Yeah, <laughs> it's you know it, it it's the the old world beauty of a modern city, and it's it it I think shows very nicely some of the major contradictions that we live with every day. And I think it really adds to um, the quality of life that we experience here. And I just wanted to say that though this uh, picture um, is uh, a, a youngster in terms of its ultimate lifetime, it's uh, a few years old, uh, the, the ferry boat that it shows is already a historic structure because it has been replaced by the newer pedestrian only uh, ferries. And so um, it's, uh, you may not have intended it as a, a sort of historical document, but there is that overlay to it just based on, uh, on how things change and sometimes change in a very short time. Well, actually, there's a, a great quote um, from Dorothea Lang, and let me read it because I'll mess it up. I, my memory is not what it should be. Photography takes a moment out of time altering life by holding it still. And I think that pretty well sums this up. Um, and, and of course, you're right. I had no inkling that this was going to be one of the last pictures of the old style ferry working on the river. Um, but so often um, my pictures, um, we'll see a little later on, will sort of stand the test of time. And it, it's because I'm, I'm trying to capture something more than a picture. I want, um, I want it to be architecturally stimulating. I want design elements in it and so on and so forth. So I think we have one more picture that relates to the first kind of general question. And it's this of a barber shop on uh, North Broad Street. And it, if you care to speak about that. Well, this, this was inspired by Walker Evans, one of my real heroes. Uh, there's a picture of a, a barbershop down in the French Quarter. Right. And, and so this is my 300th anniversary tribute to Walker Evans. 
I just love the horizontal lines. You got the, the square patterns of the window. Uh, you've got the double steps. So at some point this was a double. Yes. Um, some enterprising barber probably turned it into a single. He probably lives in one side and has his shop in the other. And even the awning over the door has these wonderful parallel lines coming straight out at you. And it's the simplicity of, and the elegance of these small, uniquely New Orleans type buildings. It, it is, I, I mean, it's all of those things. It's, it's an incredible, uh, as you say, display of geometry, um, both uh, physical and, and sort of ephemeral with the shadows doing their own part to create the parallelograms and uh, kind of slanted elements of the picture. And it's also the, one of the reasons I, I like this picture so much is because it makes you think about what might be going on inside of there. The um, barbershops, whether they're, um, re regardless of the community they serve, are these little sort of micro hubs for neighborhood information, for uh, uh, entrepreneurship. They're, they're just uh, an almost invisible part of this urban landscape that I think we would know how much they mean if they were suddenly gone. And, and I, I always think about this picture in that context as well. Well, you're absolutely right. You know, the barbershop, and I suppose the, the, the counterpart, the beauty parlor, is the layperson's psychiatrist. They go in and they talk and they share and they vent. And um, I've spent a lot more time in barbershops other than getting my hair cut because it's, it is, it's a show, it's a dynamic, it is a presence in the community and, and, and not this one particularly, but many of them act, actually act as the cog in the wheel of a neighborhood. Yes. People are gonna be out of town, the mail is delivered there. If they have something from the UPS or, or FedEx, it'll be delivered there so that it, it doesn't go, the, the porch pirates don't get a hold of it. So yes, they are this wonderful integral part of all of the different neighborhoods. Um, wanted to um, to move on to the second question, and as um, as it's being formed, uh, if the slide could go up, slide number four. Um, another project of yours, uh, the Katrina Decade, uh, a book and exhibition from 2015, uh, is obliquely referenced in um, in this current book, New Orleans Portrayed. Um, uh, a photograph of the deserted charity hospital complex summarizes some of your thoughts on the lingering effects of that giant storm of 2005. And I was wondering if you could talk about how the specter of that event sort of hung in the background and um, did, it, did it pose uh, or what kind of um, what kind of conditions did it pose or impose on you as you looked toward a project that on some basic level was designed to be celebratory, I, I'm, I'm guessing. And, uh, and if you could just talk about this picture in context of, your, of New Orleans portrayed, but also the Katrina decade. Well, clearly Katrina, the hurricane was the event, but the story has been the aftermath. And it is, you know, you can call it the 800 pound gorilla in the room. It is ever present whenever you drive into neighborhoods and, and um, you see the remnants of it. But what is so daunting about this is, is that uh, one day when I was leaving um, my gallery, I, I noticed this sky and I raced down to the Tulane Medical Center parking garage and drove up, I think it was five or six floors. Um, and this was the picture I got. And that was the only time that I tried to shoot the exterior of that building uh, at sunset. And I just think that it, 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 it speaks to 
some of the successes and failures of our post Katrina rebuild. Uh, here is a building that's over a million square feet. Um, it's an iconic structure. It represents the uh, medical community and the medical history for a very long time in the city of New Orleans. And um, it is something that we are still trying to get our hands around and figure out how we can best utilize it for the benefit of the, of the city and the people. Right. It's, um, I, I mean, this, this building, of course, uh, resonates to one degree or another with um, contemporary New Orleanians, uh, whether their knowledge of it is as someone who has used its services or just worked in the neighborhood or simply knows what it is by, by virtue of what it proclaims as a piece of architecture. But again, going back to the whole idea of the tricentennial, this type of uh, of enterprise, a hospital for the people of New Orleans has been something that has been almost ingrained in the city from, from its beginning. And so even though this building uh, dates to the 1930s, it represents a tradition that is much, much older than that. And uh, again, I, 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 some people might consider it a uh, Katrina picture, but it's it's a lot more than that to uh, to me and what it represents historically. Well, John, didn't you at one point have a, a job there at the hospital? I did. Uh, summers uh, um, when I was going to college, I uh, I, I worked in uh, worked in charity hospital, and um, I wanted to I wanted to talk to you at the end about pictures you may not have made that reference this. So we'll, we'll maybe hold on to that for a little later in the, uh, in the conversation. There's no truth to the rumor that you were doing brain surgery? <laughs> there is no truth to that. <laughs> so, um, the, um, the next question um, pertains to the next several slides um, for um, for um, Bruce Kelpstrom's uh, information. They are slides five through eight. And although you have addressed it a little bit in the earlier remarks, I wanted to know if you would talk about your approach to photography in general. Um, and you broadly characterize it as documentary, but how do you, how do you define that aspect of it? Um, I, I find that the work is also insightful, even lyrical, but still uh, descriptive or, or documentary on some basic plane. And if you could talk about what goes through your mind when make, making a picture, and especially the pictures we're going to see right now, um, uh, I, I think it would, um, it would help uh, our uh, audience better understand um, the whole concept of New Orleans portrayed. Well, it, it's, you know, I don't want to overthink it. Uh, I've been fortunate. Um, it, whenever I'm asked to speak or if I give a workshop, I never focus on the equipment, the computer, things like that. I said, it's always about learning to look. And if you don't look, you can't see. And if you don't see it, you can't take a picture of it. So most of the time when I'm out taking pictures, I don't have a definitive shot list that I'm looking for. I try to keep my vision very broad and um, you know, I, I drive up and down St. Charles all the time. And so I'd seen this house um, for quite some time. And, and I saw hundreds of pictures of the trees, but you didn't really see any part of the house because the, the lighting differential was such that, that it, the trees were properly exposed and the shadows of the house were kind of lost. And so I took it upon myself to kind of approach this to see if I could kind of capture the massiveness of the trees and of course, this is a very, very large house on St. Charles Avenue, but it's almost dwarfed by the scale. And it's very symmetrical. I mean, you've got a lot of parallel lines, but the tree limbs 
take and break that all up. And so in, it, it, it feels, I think, very lyrical, but it's very secure. You don't see any converging um, angles or, or so on and so forth. And, and so um, it, it's just a, a you know, I, I wish I could say that these were all thought out but I've just been very lucky. I'm in the right place at the right time. And, and, and so oh, when you, when you talked about not having, um, not wanting to overthink things, it reminded me of, of, uh, something from a different field of endeavor. I believe it was, uh, Yoki Barra who said, you can't think and hit at the same time. <laughs> and so is, is it that kind of, uh, understanding that the picture will, make itself known to you when you're prepared to, uh, to receive what it's, what is being offered. So you're exactly right. That's, that's, um, very, very true. I don't think I find a lot of the pictures. They find me. I'm in a situation and all of a sudden something will become very clear. And it, in many cases is a surprise and especially when I was shooting film, I'm, I'm shooting a lot of digital now. Um, you know, you didn't know what you had until you processed right. the film, looked at the contact sheets, and um, it was always a surprise. And and when I go out and shoot, I do not remember everything that I've shot. I, I don't know if I'm in the zone or or you know I just don't have enough gray cells to to process all that data. But when I start editing, I go, oh wow that's interesting. Let me look at that a little bit more closely. And I find a lot of photographs that way. So the important thing is to shoot. <laughs> Thank you, Bruce, for putting on the next slide. Um, David, could you talk about this rather famous uh, uh, person who we lost recently? Yes. Um, Leah Chase in my book is one of the most gracious women to ever walk this earth. Um, I was very fortunate in getting to photograph her many times. Um, and all of the previous times she was dressed in her chef's garb in the very colorful part of the restaurant. And this was for a book, um, uh, Poppy Tooker's book on, on some, you know, culinary things. And uh, I asked, Mrs. Chase, Miss Chase, if, if we could do something a little different. And she said, oh, David, we can do anything you want. And so I said, well, how do you start your day? And she said, well, I'm here early. And um, I, you know, I've got to make the list and I got to see if we've got all of the food product that we need and spices and so on and so forth. And I said, well, could I come over there and take some pictures of you? And so I went over and uh, she was standing there. Uh, filling out her grocery list, a list of things that she needed to accomplish during the day. And I said, good morning. And I said, could, she said, where do you want me? And I said, would you just stay right there? And so we talked a little bit. I took a few pictures and this is what I got. And um, afterwards she says, well, that, that's too quick, David. Don't you need to take more time? And I said, no, I don't think I do. And she says, well, then sit down. We're gonna have breakfast together. So I got to have breakfast with Leah Chase. So it, that's how that came about. Wow, that's great. What a wonderful backstory to this uh, great portrait of uh, not only a famous, but a beloved New Orleanian uh, anyway. And if, uh, if the next slide could be advanced, I think it's something completely different. You call this millennial Gothic. And I uh, wondered if you could talk a little bit about what, not so much what's going on in the picture, but what was going on when you made the picture. Well, here again, I'm in my gallery. I'm closing up. It's in the summer. You can see they're in summer garb. And I look out of my window and this young couple is leaning up against the cemetery wall, waiting for commanders to open in the evening. And so I go back and I get my camera and I walk outside. I said, excuse me, may I take your picture? And they wanted to know what I wanted them to do. And I said, nothing, just stay like you are. Now, here again, 
you don't see this when you're taking the picture. You only see it after you process it and are looking at it. But she's got on her left arm, the, sh the arm that's down to her side holding her shoes, is a tattoo of Willy Wonka. And on her right arm, the one that's holding her phone, is a Disney motif. She's got tattoos on her arms, legs, and feet. She's got a snow white purse. So obviously she's got a Disney thing. So there they are, very attractive young couple. And what are they doing? I, I'm assuming they're texting each other, but we don't know. Um, and, you know, I don't think I need to remind you, but I'm an old fella. And if I was standing next to a pretty girl like that, I sure in the heck would not be looking at my phone. I'd be looking at her, holding her hand, whatever, you know, we used to do. But it was completely an accident in that I just happened to be looking as I was moving through my gallery, going to the front door to leave for the evening. I took the picture and then they opened the doors at Commander's and they wanted to scurry off. So I quickly gave them my card and I said, look, would you please send me an email and I would be happy to send you a print. I've never heard from them. So I'm hoping somebody will recognize them, let them know, and I wanna send them a print because I think it's, it's and in the title is pretty self-explanatory. I mean, this is what the millennials do. This is the Gothic. Yeah. I think we have one more uh, picture in this segment. Uh, again, um, uh, a, a person who may not be as well known as the work that he produces around town. But um, uh, this, I, I just wanted to say that your, um, your book um, has a good deal of what is normally called the small trades uh, in it. Individual entrepreneurs, whether they're barbershops or a sign maker like this one, there's a metal worker, a bevelo, is, there's, they're the people who uh, I, in, in some ways, uh, define a community, whether it's New Orleans or another community. And it is um, the, the individuals and the very particular work that they do that, um, uh, that makes places special, and including, uh, including New Orleans. And just wondered if you wanted to comment not only on that kind of thought, but um, on, on this particular picture as well. Well, certainly, uh, Simone is a Frenchman, and don't make the mistake of calling him Simon, um, but he is a bona fide character, and he has come up with these signs, um, the painting method, and he has this little kind of a, a very helter-skelter uh, space on Jackson Avenue, and you're absolutely right. I wanted to try to capture these unique individuals and their talents because they've been here my entire life in New Orleans. And you wonder, are we breeding any more of them? And I certainly hope so, because I think that this is what makes New Orleans so truly enduring and exciting um, for people to come and, and, and slowly and, and to learn about this. Um, he, as I said, is very talented, uh, very opinionated. Um, and and uh, there's another fella uh, down in the, in the Ninth Ward. Um, they are in somewhat of a competition. Um, but it, New Orleans is big enough for both of them. And they, I, I think, must do very well. But uh, you're right, I want to, I tell people when I did this book, I would travel the same streets that I've been traveling for 40 plus years. But at one corner, instead of turning right, that I'd always done, I turned left. And so subsequently I was finding a lot of things that I had overlooked for 30 years. And so um, the, the, the process was, in a way, trying to get me to reintroduce myself to New Orleans. And, right. it, you know, it was like a treasure hunt. Yeah, so, I mean, I, I, and I think that that idea comes through in the book. Had you, I, I, I know a lot of the pictures that you've made and 
you didn't remake pictures for the tricentennial. You, you went out and made new pictures. And, um, and so uh, with that segment com concluded, I wanted to go into the next question. Again, we've touched on elements of this and this will, um, this will take us through slide number 16. And uh, um, the idea of icons of New Orleans, what, um, what sticks out as being typically New Orleans or fundamentally New Orleans is, is probably a different thing in everybody's mind. I mean, it may gravitate around food or music or architecture or public celebration, but um, there are some of the pictures in, um, in your book that sort of, to me, um, use that sort of gravitational pull of a New Orleans icon uh, to, to kind of keep them in orbit and, and keep, uh, keep the viewer engaged in all of these different uh, circuits that life in New Orleans takes. And um, I, I just wanted you to, to say a few words kind of with that in the background about the next several pictures uh, so we could get a sense of that. Well, you're right. Um, I will take a picture of an icon, but I will try to shoot it from a different perspective or, or a different view. Um, this is the Napoleon house. It's pretty apparent the pictures of Napoleon, the portraits and so on and so forth, the lamp and then in the reflection you see a bust. But you know, you have to look into my picture to see it. And uh, that's what I try to do. And, and I don't know if you remember this, but we were going to have an early lunch at the Napoleon house. And we were sitting not too far from where this fellow was. And I just got up and took a couple of quick shots and sat down. And so it's your fault. <laughs> it's, you know, I, one of my main premises is I want people to look into my photographs and I want them to look around my photographs because I don't want them to know everything upon first glance. And so we can go to the next one and, and we can expand on it a little bit more. Yeah, there's, there's certainly, um, it's certainly true that a second look at a lot of your pictures reveals new information. Uh, including this one. Yeah. This is uh, Chief Spoon, one of the Mardi Gras Indians. Now, I'm sorry, I will not go out and take pictures of the Indians parading. It's been done and it's been done exquisitely. I want to get in and, and see how and what the Indians do. And so I was introduced to him and he invited me over. And I can assure you the rest of his house was just as cluttered as this room with feathers and headdresses and the materials. And it was absolutely amazing. I mean, in a couple of the other rooms, his wife's costumes, because when he's a chief, he's got a his princess or whatever the, the title is hundreds if not thousands of dollars of materials and and he is literally we are within 10 days of mardi gras so it is frantic i mean he's up late working and you see the long thread that he's pulling and here again this is one of those individual crafts of a craftsman i mean you don't go to uh, Mardi Gras Indians are us and get your feathers. You know, you, right. you've got to design it, compose it, design it, and then execute it. And, and the hundreds and hundreds of hours that these individuals devote is inspirational. And, and so I, I think that, that here again, look around, see all of the different things in there, and I think you'll enjoy the picture a little bit more. Yeah, I, I, and this is not only a, a photograph of a moment, but again, like uh, like so much of your work, it uh, it is infused with a much much larger historical perspective. The black masking Indian or Mardi Gras Indian tradition in New Orleans is uh, over a century old, uh, and what's um, although maybe on the day you took this picture, there was not 
a young person from the neighborhood in the room watching Chief Spoon sew and learning from it. But this is such a part of the tradition as well, where, uh, again, just as there are no Mardi Gras Indian uh, stores uh, to go to, there are also no real Mardi Gras Indian schools. And this is a, a, an individually passed and learned tradition that um, when we see these um, uh, people on the street and in this incredible creation, sometimes it's hard to over, uh, or it's easy to overlook the fact that um, this is not a one day, few hours of uh, being on the street. There, there's, there's a, a life behind that, and there's also a tradition that's being pushed forward from it. So. Well, you're, you're absolutely right that we, we, we chose not to have any of the little Indians in there because it was such a tight space. I was concerned that you, it would get so cluttered and with the, the, the small Indians in there watching and trying to help, I don't think he would have made those big, beautiful sewing movements. So, but you're absolutely right. It is a communal thing. Um, and, and you're right, the public schools do not um, offer, you know, headdress sewing 101. I mean, it is, it is um, this is something that is passed down from families, neighbors, and, um, you know, I just want to get a, a few pictures of it. I think um, that this next one kind of plays into the the association of music with the city, and uh, again, you can tell the story. <laughs> this is Tom Sancton, a very dear friend of yours and mine. Uh, Tom is is a noted author, um, outstanding musician. Uh, he was the uh, Time Bureau chief in Paris for years. And I wanted somebody like him who represents the traditional um, lineage of music. He learned how to play the clarinet from the old timers at the Preservation Hall, George Lewis and, and a lot of these others. And so um, we asked permission to go in during the day and, and could we please, you know, spend about 30 minutes in there and take some pictures. And Jaffe was very, very nice, very, you know, obliging. And so we got in there and I, I asked Tom, would he play something? And um, he started to play, do you know what it would mean to miss New Orleans? And, and so to be in there, have him make his clarinet talk. I mean, it's just incredible. And you stand there and you realize the hundreds of hours and the hundreds of musicians, famous, infamous, and soon to be famous, that have earned their bones in an institution like that, uh, it's daunting. And so I'm feeling a lot of that while I'm taking the pictures. But then when I'm looking at the images, it becomes even more apparent. And, and so it, it's, it is truly one of our gems. And we, uh, we move on to the next picture. We don't leave the French Quarter yet, but... Um... <laughs> this, this is exactly what I was talking about. I was drawn to this early on a Sunday morning because of the rectangles. You see the rectangles in the sidewalk, you see the rectangles in the, in the shuttered doors, you see the rectangles in the, in the bricks going up the side. And I thought, gosh, wouldn't it be interesting if somebody would walk through and give it some scale? And I don't remember exactly, but within a minute or two, this fella comes mark walking through and I take two shots. One, he's right in the middle. It's too symmetrical. The other one, he's there. And of course I am shooting film on this. This is actually an older picture. It wasn't shot in that, that year, but it, it is very important to what I'm trying to capture. And 
So I come back and I process the, and, and, and I'm spending the rest of the day down in the quarter taking pictures, maybe half the day. I don't remember if I thought I had anything good or not because I wasn't shooting digital. So I'm not looking at my camera to see what I've got. A couple of days later, I process the film, I make a contact sheet and there it is. And I'm drawn to it. And I really like it because he's nicely dressed. I mean, you know, he's not wearing flip flops and, and, and shorts and a baseball cap on backwards, uh, you know, and, and, and he's carrying a loaf of French bread. And so I look at it even more closely and he looks vaguely familiar. And, and, and it turns out that he is one of the journeyman musicians that play in the all night jazz clubs. Nobody famous, but he's, he, he makes his living doing this. So I really liked it. I mean, I couldn't have, I couldn't have put him in a better place. I mean, his, the, the way his feet are falling, where the bag is. Actually, if you look very closely, he's holding the bag at the bottom. So he's a very, very brave fellow because the, the twist to put the bread in the, in the bag is, I mean, the, you know, it's twisted, is at the bottom. And I can promise you there isn't a person alive that would pick up a loaf of French bread off of a sidewalk in the French Quarter and then eat it. <laughs> but, and so later I had a print in the gallery and, and uh, a writer was in and she was complimenting me on my work. And she says, okay, what one picture says it all about New Orleans? And I said, oh, please, uh, you, you know, New Orleans is far too evolved to have one picture. And then I said, well, but, but wait, wait. I said, this one. And I pointed to it and she said, why this one? And I said, well, what are we known for? I said, architecture, food, the bread. And that guy's a musician, the music. There it is, the Holy Trinity. And she goes, wow, that's clever. When did you think of that? And I said, just now, because you asked me. <laughs> but it, it it's, you know, it's not perfectly symmetrical. I'm at it a little bit of an angle, but I think that gives it some of that movement that it needs to. Uh, and here again, as I look at it, uh, you know, I think I was channeling Walker Evans in this picture. Well, the um, the next picture, we cross a river and, and sort of uh, make a, a different um, mind leap as well to, uh, to <laughs> something we, we, of course, we know that New Orleans has a West Bank component as well, but it, it is not often one thought of in the same way as, uh, as the French Quarter or other portions of the East Bank. And so um, I, I, wanted, uh, I wanted to ask you about your exploration of, uh, of the Western uh, West Bank of New Orleans, including Algiers Point or Greater Algiers and down the uh, you know, down the uh, to the lower coast toward uh, um, toward English Turn. Well, it's part of New Orleans, and uh, I wasn't going to stick with the cliches. I wanted to push out, and as you can see, this is an enormous apartment complex that was you know, destroyed during Katrina, and these pictures were taken before. Um, a group got in there and turned it into a, a this was just all graffiti by individuals. And um, then there was an orchestrated effort. But what is interesting is, is obviously this was destroyed in 2005. We're now in 2021, soon to be 2022. And it is a palette that keeps changing because when I go back on a semi-regular basis just to see what's going on. And all of a sudden, you'll see lots of um, abandoned tires in the parking lot. And then the next time I'll go back, they're gone. Um, the, a lot of the, the, the artwork gets painted over and then somebody else does something else. So it is this communal canvas. And, and when you look at it geographically, the proximity from it to downtown, it's not very far, so it, it's amazing how all of this takes place. Another landmark that we almost lost, yeah. um, uh, but um, again, uh, there, there's 
you, you know, we can tell from the sign that yes, this is Little Dizzy's Cafe, but there's there's just this sort of uh, elegant randomness to um, uh, to the way the picture is put together. It's um, uh, you you have to start reconstructing the picture from its different elements, but and, and you know maybe maybe not one in a thousand or 10,000 people with a camera would see this picture the way that you did. And um, uh, again, the uh, fact that it's, uh, you know, in a, not a non-famous neighborhood, but certainly not a neighborhood that everyone uh, goes to. I, I think it's wonderful. It's, um, there are probably more people who have heard of Lil Dizzy's Cafe than have actually passed by it or visited it. I think the, the kind of making uh, making this sort of mental landmark physical is one thing that the picture does. Well, actually, the first thing that I was drawn to were all of the mishmash of wires in the left, on the left. And then I, I you know, I saw the, the parallels and the perpendiculars and, and, and the diagonal of the angle of the roof and of course it was in the morning. So we had that nice direct sunlight with some uh, shadows coming off of the awning. Arguably some of the best red beans and rice in the city of New Orleans. Uh, the Bakke family is this incredible family of New Orleans. Um, the owner Harold, uh, you know, ran the business for years, but his, older brother is the editor-in-chief i think of the new york times mm. and their younger brother who has a disability is an institution in this place um and he you know helps clean up and, and, and do dishes and stuff and so you know here again one of the unique things and great things about new orleans is we are a city of families. I mean, we look at the Manning family, we look at the Marcellus family, you know, the, the Bakke family, um, I, you know, you, it goes on and on and on. And they they all remain here, which is, I, as best I can tell, is, is unique um, because these institutions are, um, the Nevilles, I mean, you know, it, it's just remarkable, the importance that they, and the gifts that they contribute to the city culturally. So it's more than just food. Yes, it is. It's, and it's, so, it's um, uh, here we are uh, on the riverfront. And uh, um, again, uh, streetcars are um, part of Part of New Orleans, but we tend to think of them as uh, along the tree-shaded St. Charles Avenue, mostly, and Canal Street, and a few other places. But this is, um, to me, an unexpected take on the idea of a streetcar in New Orleans. It is, and as I said earlier, you know, I, I want to take all of those iconic things, but show them in a different venue, and. We were walking, you know, across the tracks, um, and and the streetcar was coming toward me, and it was late in the afternoon, and the setting sun was reflecting off the rails, and there was all of this geometry that just kind of hit me in the face, and um, you know, I I hadn't given a single thought about shooting a picture of a streetcar right. uh, when we were down there. I don't know what I was looking for. And I, the camera was inside my bag. And so I quickly pulled it out um, and, and composed a couple of shots and then you know, got out of the way so I wouldn't get run over. And, and, but but it, is, it is, again, um, well, I studied art history in college. And the premise there was, and, and of course, I did it because where I went to school was a liberal arts school and they didn't have a photography program. But it dawned on me that by learning about art history and the methods by which people painted and, and the composition that they used and so on and so forth, 
I would see those elements when I've held the camera to my face. And, um, you know, in, in retrospect, I was a genius figuring out that art history was what I needed to study because to this day, um, I go to museums all the time to look at paintings and sculptures and, and, and different forms of art. Uh, I look at all the art books because you know, we, we, these elements are, are available to all of us and it's just how we kind of put them together, which makes it important. I think we have this final picture in this segment, and I'm not sure how we're doing on time. Uh, um, uh, but uh, again, a, a subject that is often associated with the city is its above ground burial practices. And uh, this is, um, I'll, I'll, I'll let you say about, about this what you'd like. And then there was one other comment I wanted to make about it. It's titled Three Tombs. And in these three tombs, you see angel, some sort of an urn, or, or I don't know what you'd call it, uh, in, a, in a crucifix. You see the benign neglect of these old, wonderful cemeteries. You also see that over the years, they've been, you know, um, taken advantage of. People have, have, have looted them. They've um, taken off some of the statuary, the, and, 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 which is, you know, a heartbreaking situation. But it, I just think it singly points out the, a little bit of the architecture, how we refer to them as the cities of the dead. And, and I think um, that that kind of plays into the, the observation I wanted to make that um, when you, when I look at these, I, certainly you see um, three tombs in a cemetery, but you, I also think about a row of shotgun houses in a block that are in some ways very much alike, but an, enough different in their details to uh, to help you understand that it's individuals who um, who occupy these structures and not um, not just anonymous uh, anonymous people? I um I think the last picture um, in this in the deck uh, references the the book itself um, uh, and um, I suspect we've we've gone to our allotted time and. Um, uh, just uh, don't don't want to to overstay our um, our welcome here with the book festival, but um, uh, you people can see that uh, uh, what the book looks like if they are uh, browsing their um, local bookstore or um, library to uh, uh, to uh, to read a copy. And uh, also wanted to um, uh, to say that the in addition to the very fine photographs uh, of, of David's that are in the book, um, uh, along with uh, introductory comment by him. There's also a, a, a nice essay about David's work by uh, Lawrence Powell, and um, I'll take credit for my minor contribution to this book as well. But um, David, it's been a, a pleasure um, for me to interview you. I will uh, would like to, again, thank the Book Festival and all the people who were for viewing this presentation. And um, with that, I will give you the last word to say whatever you would like about New Orleans portrayed. Well, it, it, it was this great body of work that I was very excited about. And of course, the launch was to happen shortly after the pandemic launched itself into our lives. And so all of the interviews, all of the book signings were canceled. And it's been very painful in that regard. Um, ULL Press has been outstanding. They were wonderful. I mean, incredible to work with. I think their production of the book is very, very nice. It's some of the best work I've, I've seen them do. Um, you know, I'm, I'm sorry that, that it didn't get 
the attention that it probably should have at the beginning. I mean, you know, we were scheduled to be at the Louisiana Book Festival last year, so on and so forth. Um, but I'm here, <clears throat> you know, uh, I tell people, you know, failure is not an option. I, I, I'm only trained to do one thing in life and that's to take pictures. Um, but John, you've been a, a near and a dear friend for years and years and years, your support, your interest in my work and, and your kind words uh, have been very meaningful to me. And um, I sure do appreciate the time and your energies and your friendship. Thank you. And um, I will just close by saying we look forward to seeing everyone in person at next year's Louisiana Book Festival. So thanks again to the festival's organizers, our technical support uh, today, and um, we look forward to seeing you online and in person. Thanks so much. All the best. Thank you for watching this presentation of the virtual 2021 Louisiana Book Festival. Please visit our official bookseller, Cavalier House Books, and receive 20% off all featured festival titles through the end of the year. A special thank you to our festival sponsors. The Louisiana Book Festival will return on October 29th, 2022.